In this module, we will be discussing creating equitable remote learning experiences for families and students. So the first thing we're going to be looking at is UDL, which is Universal Design for Learning. It's a framework for designing learning experiences um, that enable all students to be able to access um, the standards that you're presenting and really get them involved and excited about what they're seeing. Um, so what we want to do is we, we're not just going to rely on one method of communicating to children. So we're going to have multiple means of representation. We're going to give them lots of different ways of acquiring information and knowledge. Um, and that's something that you'll see in a lot of the modules in this course. So there's videos, there are readings, there are um, different uh, toolboxes that you can access. And this is really ways of giving you different ways to understand the information. Um, we also want to give you multiple means of expression. So there's different ways to demonstrate what you know. We have video discussion boards, we have written discussion boards, there's different activities. And that is trying to access you and allow you to be able to express what you know in multiple ways. And another is multiple means of engagement. So making sure that there's lots of different motivators to get you involved in what goes on in each module. And this is something that we want to emulate in our classrooms as well. So universal design of learning has three principles. So the first principle is to provide multiple means of representation. The second principle is to provide multiple means of action and expression. And the third is to provide multiple means of engagement. And that really goes back to what we just, just discussed. Multiple means of expression means that there's lots of different ways for you to gather the material and the information. The second way is, second principle means that there's lots of different ways for you to express what you've learned. And the third is to keep you involved in the class. So the reason that we use universal design for learning is we want to make sure that you're able to access the information and that your students are able to access the information and to also show that they understand what's going on in the class in lots of different ways. So we're not putting a stumbling block in front of them because they're really not good writers. Or we're not putting a stumbling block in front of them because they're really not good at oral communication. We're making sure that all of these different ways of communicating and showing and accessing knowledge allows the student to be able to show what they know and to be able to learn in various different ways while we're still keeping the expectations high. And we also assume that not all students are the same. Not everyone learns or is engaged in the same way. So our goal is to be flexible. Our goal is to engage all different learners and to allow for multiple means of achievement. So a lot of times when people think about uh, UDL, they think that it's always going to be digital. It doesn't need to be, um, but it needs to be accessible and it needs to be equal in terms of uh, children being able to access the information. So. We want to make sure that if we are using technologies, and especially during COVID, a lot of us have been relying on, on technologies. We want them to be usable. We don't need them, want them to have to, uh, you know, find different ways to access that material. We want it so even if you're a special education learner, an ELL learner, you're still able to understand what's going on in the class and access the material. Um, we want them to be able to be usable with assistive technology. So if they need a hearing aid, they're able to do so. If they need to have it translated, they're able to do so. So we want to make sure that the technology really fits the children in our classroom. And we want them to have lots of different options on how to access that material as well. So if they're learning from a phone, they're able to do it. If they're learning from a, a, an adaptive device, um, they're able to do it. So we want to make the learning environment flexible and accommodating in order to bring in all different types of learners. And we want to also make sure that it's accessible for our special education students, even when they have unique needs. So if they need to have um, it CC'd so that they can see um, what you're saying that's written out as well, that should be something that is um, accessible for all children and all students.
So we want to know the students in our classroom. We want to know what environments they're in. We want to know what adaptive technology we're using. And we want to make sure that we are adapting it to the children in our classrooms. We want it to be usable and accessible. We want to provide access and we want to increase participation by what we do. So we want it to be something that really gets people involved. They're able to get on. They're able to participate and be part of the classroom environment no matter where they are, no matter what's going on, no matter what is in front of them and holding them up. And we want them to be able to show that they're actually achieving the standards that we're setting, the targets that we set in each module um, so that we know, or in each lesson, we know that they are able to achieve what's being done and they can show you. So whether it's by the discussion boards or what, you know, whatever it is, they're able to show that they understand what's going on in the classroom. So how do we do this remotely? Um, this is a real stumbling block. We're thinking, how are we supposed to get this information across when we have so many things that we want to do and half of us are working remotely? So the first thing we want to do is we want to create a centralized location for communication with students and families. So we want to use Canvas, Remind, uh, Google Classroom, Class Dojo, whatever it is we're doing, we want parents and students to be able to log on and see exactly what's happening in the classroom. And we want to make sure that they're able to communicate with you. So if they're not able to do it via email, they just don't have the time, they can just look on Class Dojo and say, oh, today they all went and they uh, wrote poetry about what was outside of their windows. We want it to be accessible no matter what the schedule, no matter what's going on. We, would, we could think about using a flipped classroom module. So in a sense, this class is flipped so what a flipped classroom is, is that instead of sitting there lecturing to our kids, we've pre-recorded that. So when the children come on, they're actually just completely involved in the activities and the interactions that you've set up for them. So that actual sort of instruction and lecturing takes place at a different time where they can access it whenever they want. And when they come on to the remote learning, that's when the activities begin. We want to make sure that students are collaborating and discussing. And we can do that in breakout rooms on Zoom, Google Meet. We can find lots of different ways that children and you can talk to each other so that it's not just the teacher lecturing and then having static activities. We want to make sure that there's lots of interaction that also go on. Peer-to-peer -peer learning is extremely important. Now, the biggest thing is we want to make sure that they have individual support and feedback. So this is more critical than ever that we are talking with our students, we're providing feedback, we're interacting with them. It's just so easy for kids to get lost remotely. And we want to make sure that they are still part of our classroom experience, even if they never set foot in our classrooms at all. We want to have enrichment opportunities. We want to do things that really get them involved. Puzzles, games, experiments, art projects. And these are just some ideas that we can do to make sure that children are really interacting and involved and enjoying what we're teaching. Otherwise, they're never going to learn. And we want to make sure that they have time that they can self-assess. So those targets are so important so that they can look back and say, am I meeting the rubric? Am I achieving the goals of this module? Am I understanding what's being taught in this classroom? Now, the last thing we need to think about are issues of bias. We need to know our students. Do they have access to the internet? Do they have access to a computer? Are they in an iPod? Are they on a phone? Are other kids in the house borrowing it? Is it just them? That can they log on at any time? Another is connectivity. Do they have wireless? Is the wireless consistent? Are there times that they can't get on? Is that hampering what's going on? And if so, how can we make accommodations for them? Another issue would be environment. Do they have a quiet place to get online, to do their schoolwork, to talk to you? Or is it a very loud environment that's going on behind them? Is it chaotic? Is it frightening? These are things we need to know. And the other is relevancy. If their world right now is so crazy chaotic. There's so many things going on that they can't concentrate. That school seems like it's second best of everything else that's going on because they really need to keep themselves safe, keep their siblings safe, deal with sick family members. Is the class still relevant? And is there a way to reach out to those learners? So really, 
In a situation like this, when we're talking about universal design for learning, when we're talking about uh, remote learning, the more we know our students and our students' needs and the families that are connected to them, the more successful we will be in teaching our students. Play this game